Hello and welcome to my channel IELTS Listening. Let's start with one of the best practice tests for improving listening skills. Test is in four part, part one, part two, part three, and part four. Now look at part one. Part one. You will hear a conversation between a staff member from Gaia's Guardians and a man who wants to do something to protect the environment. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Hello, how may I help you? Well, I've been seeing these yellow boxes in front of a lot of houses in my neighborhood. Just wondered what they were for. I noticed your phone number on all of them, so I called. Could you tell me about your business? We do do recycling, but we're not a business. Gaia's Guardians is a non-profit group. We encourage recycling as a way of protecting the environment. I don't know. I mean, it is a good idea, but I really don't read the newspaper every day or anything. And we don't come collect newspapers every day. In fact, we only do pickups every other week. Oh, well, then maybe I could help. I mean, in my neighborhood, there's too much rubbish lying around everywhere. I'd like to help out, I guess. That's great, sir. You're doing the right thing. OK, I need to get your contact information. What's your name, please? Peter Wisrow. Peter, how do you spell your last name? W-I-S-R-O-W? No, actually, it's W-I-S-R-O-U-G-H. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm a terrible speller. You're a good speller. It's just that my family are terrible pronouncers. You're quite a card, Peter. OK, now what's your address? Number 168 Bridge Road. That's here in London. How about if I have any questions? I'm sending you a copy of our booklet too. The booklet has our phone number and our email address, helpline at blackcat.com. That's H-E-L-P-L-I-N-E -E at B-L-A-C-K-C-A-T dot com. But I nearly forgot to ask, what's your postcode? B-S-9-7-P-U. P-S-9-7-B-U? No, that's B as in boy, S-9-7-P as in Peter, U. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. So, I'm guessing those yellow boxes I saw are for recycled newspapers. Yes, that is correct, and it's free of charge. Wow, that's good news. Do you recycle anything besides newspaper? Oh, yes, we recycle most everything. Glass, plastic, paper. Oh, so I can put, like, glass and plastic bottles in the box. Sorry again. Things like that you have to bring to our collection centre. And where is that? Our main centre isn't that far from you. It's actually right on the east side of Central Park. That new blue building? That's the one. Cool. Hey, what's with all those different coloured boxes outside that place? Oh, that's for the different materials we recycle. The blue is for metal, the green is for glass and plastics, and the yellow, of course, is for paper. Hmm. OK. I'll try and manage to keep all that straight. Oh, no need. They're each labelled. Great. So which one would I put magazines in? Actually, they don't go in any of the bins. 
Unfortunately, magazines can't be recycled because of the material they're made of. It's such a waste. So, would you be interested in volunteering? Um, I'll think about it. Could you send me some more info? Absolutely. Along with the newspaper box, I'll be sending you our booklet, Savvy. That is S A V V Y. It tells you about what you can do to protect the environment in your daily life. Plus, it lists things you can do as a volunteer with our group. Hey, that's cool. Thanks. My pleasure. Do you have any other questions or concerns? Nope. That's it. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear an introduction about sports matches. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. Good morning everyone. I'm Mary White, the secretary of the Exciting Sports Club. Welcome to attend matches arrangement meeting. I know you are looking forward to a great season. Now, I'd like to give you a short introduction to our arrangement in this season. This season, we still have two competitions. One is tennis and the other is soccer. Let's start with tennis. There will be six teams competition. We hope the players' ages are between 16 and 22 years old. While the number of soccer teams is only four in this season, because we hope all players' ages are no more than 20 years old. Now, in this new season there are some changes. The first one is the venue. We will arrange all our matches for both the tennis and soccer competitions in Magic Park instead of Darry Park, which was used last year. Tennis matches will be arranged on Court 2 and Court 4. We'll hold soccer matches. Our match schedule all tennis matches will be played on Sunday afternoons. All matches will begin at 2 o'clock. Soccer matches in this season will be played at 7 o'clock on Saturday evenings. The joining fee is still £30, including a new sport gear. We still offer a week of training session before formal match for our new players. There are two training sessions at 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. on next Friday and Saturday afternoon. The fee is only £12. Now, I'd like to introduce the coach of our each training session, George Hansen, who has been supervised the tennis team for over four years, will still be coach this season. While we will invite a good soccer coach, who has enough patience and professional skills to work as this season soccer coach. His name is Paul Butt. Now, look at questions 18 to 20.
Now, listen carefully and answer questions 18 to 20. In addition, we offer some activities to thank all players. Please look at your brochure. There are some activities and their time arrangements. At the beginning, we hope to start the season with a barbecue dinner on next Saturday in Magic Park. I do really hope all players will go there to enjoy the dinner and you may invite your relatives and friends. Of course they have to pay a little fee with just £5. And then, after the final match in the season, we will vote this season's MVP, the most valuable player. The two players from tennis team and soccer team will gain an honour and a prize from our sports centre. This season we hope all players can send a confirm letter to us to ensure our match arrangement. So please write to us before the deadline. It is on Thursday 18th of April. Our secretary, David Black, is in charge of collecting fees and your letters in this season. His room number is 214 and his phone is 332567. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a tutor and two students discussing the crop rice. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Good morning, everyone. So, following on from our tutorial on European agriculture last week, Daisy and Eric are going to talk about the most commonly grown crop in Asia, which is, of course, rice. Eric, can you tell us what you've been working on? Yes, yeah, sure. We've been looking at the role of rice in a number of countries, how it's grown, ways of increasing production. As I'm sure you know, rice is the staple diet throughout Asia and, in fact, 90% of the world's rice is grown and eaten there. Daisy's got some background on that. Um, well, rice was originally a wild plant which started out in the tropical regions of Asia. But there are literally hundreds of varieties today and each with different qualities. Uh, for instance, one will survive floods, while another will grow in relatively dry conditions. A third has a really lovely smell. But wherever it grows, rice needs a lot of water. What do you mean by a lot? Well, it takes about 5,000 litres to get a kilogram of rice. This can be supplied either naturally or by irrigation. And as most rice-growing countries suffer from unpredictable weather, including drought, water management really is the key. Research has become so important now that each rice-growing country in Asia has its own research institute. Whether we're talking about Japan, China or Bangladesh, and they're all coordinated by a group in the Philippines called the International Rice Research Institute. Interesting. Bangladesh, for instance, has been successfully using different rice varieties and fertilizers for 30 years. 
But because it's such a flat delta country, it's very difficult for the water to drain away after the monsoon season. So they need to find special rice crops that can survive the floods. And with global warming, the situation is more urgent than ever. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. Now I'd like to move on to our comparative study. As you can imagine, China is the world's biggest rice-producing country. Collectively, the Chinese people probably eat more than 3 billion bowls of rice every day. Quite a statistic. Mm. And of course, rice plays an important cultural role too. We then compared China to Thailand. You know, even though Thailand only has about 64 million people, it's the world's number one exporter of rice. Not China, as you might imagine. Is that so? Yes. They send their rice everywhere, in particular to Europe, as well as Africa and the Middle East. Apparently, the fact that jasmine rice is growing in popularity is one reason why Thailand's rice export industry is doing so well. People want something a bit different. And, of course, Thailand is well suited to rice growing. Good climatic conditions and lots of fresh water. Going back to China for a minute, we should mention that at the Rice Research Institute in Huangzhou, they're working on ways of improving rice yields using less water. By yields, you mean the amount they can grow? Yes. They're trying to find ways to get more rice from less land, improve the taste, but also have other things in it besides carbohydrates so that it's healthier, better for you. Good idea, considering it's the staple food. And then you've got Japan, which is totally self-sufficient when it comes to rice. This is basically because they have a high tariff on imported rice, so everyone buys the homegrown product, and they don't export much. Yes, but, you know, even though rice is a kind of sacred crop there, consumption is only half what it was in the 1960s. This trend isn't evident in Thailand or China. Interesting that you mentioned how rice is almost sacred in Japan, because I believe in Thailand it also plays an important cultural role. Absolutely. They have the royal ploughing ceremony every year, which the king always attends, and he actually scatters a new stock of seed to the farmers, who pour into Bangkok for the event. What about the global interest in organic farming? Is there such a thing as organically grown rice? Yes, indeed. And the Japanese are getting quite a taste for it, apparently. There's an experimental farm near the city of Akita in the Japanese rice belt, famous for its sake, by the way, which has pioneered organic rice production. And now it's sold all across the country. It's a bit like the recent popularity of jasmine rice in Thailand, but that's for the export market, of course. Interesting how attitudes change, isn't it? That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecture's introduction to Insect Biology 101. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good afternoon and welcome to Insect Biology 101. I'd like to begin this course with a few remarks about good insects and bad ones. Bugs are all around us and that's both a benefit and an annoyance, sometimes maybe even serious harm. First, let's talk about the good things that insects do for us. Probably the most important insect for humans, and maybe for all other life, is the bee. Bees help plants in the process of pollination, and thus are necessary to most flowers and fruit-producing trees. That is, they carry pollen from male flowers to female. If it weren't for bees, we'd have very few food plants and no fruit either. In fact, there would be no we. No lesser thinker than Albert Einstein pointed out that, without bees, humanity would be dead within a year or less. We'd starve. It's that simple. That should maybe make us just a little humble. A little less dramatic is the fact that bees also make the honey we eat. Moreover, they produce beeswax, which is useful in candles and is also used as a first-rate furniture polish. Sure, these may not be vital to our lives, but they can serve as reminders of how important bees are. That's a point I keep coming back to in this course. Though, in all fairness, I should point out that butterflies aid in pollination as well as bees. Now, here in Michigan, what's the worst part of summer? Yep, that's right, mosquitoes. But I'm talking about helpful insects, right? So let's look at the dragonfly first. If there were no dragonflies, there would be even more mosquitoes. Dragonflies mainly eat mosquitoes and also a few other insects. Yes, that's right. They don't just fly around, and they also help to eliminate harmful insects. So the next time you see a dragonfly, don't you dare kill it. Now, let's talk a little about those harmful insects. Take the mosquitoes I just mentioned as an example. Not so many years ago, mosquitoes here in America weren't just annoying, some were even deadly. They carried malaria and yellow fever. My own ancestor, the Confederate General John Bell Hood, lived through the worst battles of civil war, only to die at age 38 from yellow fever. A pest, not a bullet. Well, besides the mosquitoes, in summer there is also a kind of insect that never seems tired. Right. That is the fly. Before I go on talking, I must mention an African fly called the tsetse fly, which feeds on blood and can cause serious diseases in the people and animals that it bites. Besides, it is still a bearer of sleeping sickness, which affects around 300,000 people every year in Africa and can be treated only with toxic drugs that are hard to administer. Worse still, the drugs sometimes don't work. Other insects, of course, destroy food crops. In China, for instance, locusts continue to be a danger to the harvest in some areas. Less important, but still annoying, moths eat people's clothes and dust mites slowly destroy carpets. Worse, but still in the home, termites or white ants eat wood, the wood of your house. If they are not stopped, they can eventually destroy the whole building. Usually they seriously damage a building before anyone even notices them. So, as we all know, insects can be a real trouble. So, what to do? You can go ahead and start killing harmful insects. In the early decades after the communist revolution in China, Chairman Mao encouraged the people to swat every fly they could see. Slogans on the walls of buildings called them little capitalists. But flies reproduce too quickly for this to be a long-term solution. For some decades in the West, to kill insects with chemicals seemed a good remedy. Unfortunately, chemicals can only be used in a limited area for a limited time. It's a small-scale solution. The insects come back. Worse still, some of the poisons used, like DDT, were found harmful to the environment. Many kinds of wildlife, like hawks, were harmed. And people in chemical-using rural areas have one of the highest rates of liver cancer in the world. It's no secret that chemicals remain harmful to humans. Like all species, insects adapt to their changing environments at an amazing rate. 
when a new chemical is introduced to their habitat, the insects that survive are generally the ones with some way of resisting the harmful effects. They then breed with the other survivors, and just like that, insects become resistant to most poison in a few generations. An insect generation, remember, is a couple of months at most. So again, we have to ask, what to do? Well, there are biological solutions. Some of these are pretty simple. One is destroying the insect's habitat. You take away their home or food. Cleaning your kitchen is the best way to prevent roaches. No garbage, no food. Getting rid of marshes and swamps eliminates mosquitoes. Other solutions might include bringing in dragonflies or bats in areas where mosquitoes are many. This is a cheaper alternative to chemicals. Biological methods like this also bring no extra pollution to the environment. But you have to be careful. If you change the environment too much, you might be hurting other forms of life accidentally. One recent method of controlling insect populations involves interrupting their breeding cycle. What does that mean? It means birth control for bugs. Insects are provided with food that makes them unable to reproduce. Since they can't have babies, the population disappears, or nearly so. And since no young are born, resistance is not a problem, with no young insects developing increased resistance. Interrupt the life cycle, eliminate the bug. It's clear that we must have an understanding of the life cycle of the insect. At least, that's the plan. We'll go into more detail as the course goes along. Now, I will stop here to see whether you have any questions or not. That is the end of part 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Dear viewers, thank you for taking this listening test. Please let me know about your score in the comments section below. Keep on practicing. It's the only way to be successful. We are planning to upload more IELTS helpful videos. Please subscribe to our channel, IELTS Listening. Thank you.